I'm a philosopher and I work on the extended mind thesis, as uh, Steve has already said. And what I'm going to talk about today starts a long time ago. Right? Uh, I think Louise this morning thought she might have trumped things, talking about early 20th century uh, gas chambers as a start, but I'm going a long, long, way, a long way back. So just to get a sense of where we're going, here's our hero. Right? He's a real person, Calvisius Sabinus. Don't have a picture of him. That's a graphic. Uh, but Calvisius Sabinus was a wealthy Roman with a very poor memory. Okay? And uh, Seneca the Younger described him as a man whose reliance on slaves is so complete that he cannot even think for himself. He has bought slaves and has had them trained to memorise poetry so that he can be cultured while having nothing in his head. Right. Actually, it seems that Seneca's uh, distrust of Calvisius Sabinus might have been because Calvisius Sabinus was the son of a first-generation freed slave. So there's a political background there. But the point for the moment is just that this guy's going to be our hero later on. Right? We're not going to come back to him for a while, but at a certain point he's going to be our hero because I think he got something absolutely right about understanding cognition uh, in a world of technology. All right. Now, I should say... Virtually the whole of this talk is going to take place in, a, in the kind of political vacuum <laughs> that this morning was marked out for us so beautifully, uh, in the sense that I'm kind of going to live in that space where HCI doesn't sort of politically commentate on itself. All right? But right at the end, I'm going to say something that I hope will speak to a more kind of positive sort of reaction to HCI than this morning, as a kind of counterbalance. We'll get there at the end. So let's start with this notion of a cognitive ecology. Right, this is a term that um, Ed Hutchins uh, introduced into the distributed cognition landscape. Um, and here's a nice definition of it um, from Lynn Tribble and John Sutton in a paper that interestingly makes sense of this idea as a theoretical term for understanding Shakespearean theatre. Uh, so a cognitive ecology is a multi... Oh, well, cognitive ecology is, are the multidimensional contexts in which we remember, think, feel, sense, communicate, imagine and act, often collaboratively, on the fly, and in rich ongoing interaction with our environments. So the idea of a cognitive ecology is that in some way, and we'll get to this a bit later, cognition takes place in these assemblages of biological, social and technological elements. And that sort of general idea, you might think, you know, for a lot of people in this room, thinking from the perspective of media and technology and so on, you might think, well, that's, that's not new. Right? There's nothing new about that. I'm hopefully going to push things a bit from the philosophical perspective that does bring a certain newness to the way you might think about this. Here's the first step. Some cognitive ecologies, not all of them, are deliberately built by us. And then we insert our thinking into them if you like. They're deliberately built, in most cases, to try and make our thinking, in some sense, better. And these structures that we build, these cognitive ecologies, assemblages of technology and, and protocols and ways of behaving sometimes, they're structures that get passed on from one generation to the next. And generation here doesn't mean biological generation, it means cultural generation. So from one group to another. And what we do is we pass on the technology, the hardware, if you like, we also pass on the protocols for using that technology from one cultural group to another. And these, these deliberately constructed cognitive ecologies, um, Andy Clark and I uh, um, sometimes call a process of cognitive niche construction, so building niches in which cognition happens. And of course, as I said, these niches, they encompass technology, including, of course, in the modern world, smart and web-enabled technology, from the social web to the web of data to mobile computing to augmented reality to the kind of social machines that people like Paul Smart and Tim Berners-Lee talk about. So in the modern world, these cognitive ecologies are rich with fancy technology of the kind that many people in this room are, of course, probably all of you are uh, probably more familiar with than me. Okay, so we talked about cognitive ecologies, ecologies in which thinking happens. But interestingly, a word that was missing from the Tribble and Sutton list is the word knowledge, or the word knowing. So if we're going to accept this kind of perspective, which I've given a very general characterization of so far, how should we think about knowledge? How should we think about the notion of knowledge and the notion of knowing? 
Now, we have to make a distinction here between two different ways why we use the term knowledge. We often use the word knowledge to mean the kind of things that's stored in libraries, right? And that's a perfectly good notion of knowledge, right? The knowledge that, the, that mankind has, or whatever way you want to put that. But there's another way of thinking about knowledge, which has been the focus of most contemporary philosophical epistemology, which is where we think about knowledge as a cognitive state, if you like, the state of knowing. And once we start to focus on knowledge as a cognitive state, as a state into which each of us sometimes gets, it's very natural, and it's been the standard assumption in the epistemology literature, to think about knowledge as something that resides inside the heads of individual human beings. So, of course, when we think about knowledge that's in a library, we think about it as massively distributed through the books. When we think about the knowledge that's on the web, we think about it as distributed all over the web. When we start to think about knowledge as something that's a cognitive phenomenon, we are something where I say, I know the X. We normally thought about it as something that's inside the head. Now, it may be distributed all over the brain, depending on your view of that, although obviously many, many fans of the fMRI and locationist kind of literature think we can, we can get more fine grain than that. But, but nevertheless, it's thought about something that's inside the head of individual human beings. But maybe that's wrong. I mean, that's the wrong way to think about this. Some of us and have been arguing that even when we think about knowledge as something that is a cognitive phenomenon, something that each of us individually can have, it's still something that we need to think of as distributed. And of course, as you'll expect, I'm going to say distributed through these cognitive ecologies, the kind of thing that I've already uh, mentioned. Now, one way to start to get yourself into the right frame of mind for this is to think about the fact that the mechanisms of knowing are changing. It struck me out of the blue one day, which probably a thought many other people have had, that probably swiping and zooming are the closest we've got to cross-cultural gestures. <laughs> and that's an amazing fact. Right? The mechanisms by which uh, people are knowing are, are changing. We, then we can go further. We can talk about augmented memory. And when I think about augmented memory, I don't usually go any further than, than my phone. Right? I just think, well, look, you know, I don't store phone numbers in my brain anymore. Right? Hardly anybody does. Right? The phone numbers are stored externally in a, in a, in a device. And in a way that I'll start to make clear in a moment, if one thinks about that as part of your memory, but actually distributed into the phone, it's an augmented memory. But we can think about new technologically mediated sensory attunements. The other day I was looking at some recent research, um, which is basically a vest that's got a bunch of sensors on it, and it enables deaf people to feel words. Right? So they can follow tracks of language by feeling vibrations. That's called sensory substitution. It's a big area of research at the moment. So we can have technologically mediated sensory attunements that change the space of our sensory experience. There's lots of other things we can think about. Wearable technology, I like this one. Um, I kind of like the idea of wearable technology that tracks the tension of my corrugator muscle. Corrugator muscles around my eye, and there's robust research which suggests that when you think you know something, your corrugator muscle tightens up. Right? <laughs> and, uh, and you know we could track that. We could track our own, as it were, feelings of knowing something as well, of course, as other people's. So the mechanisms of knowing, the mechanisms of knowing are changing in, in the modern technological world. And we can start to ask questions about this. And I love this example. I've used this several times. I think it's a really nice case. Not so much for the research, which is certainly not in any way sort of surprising, but the commentary that went on around it. So a paper in, in science, I think it was a few years ago, Google Effects on Memory, cognitive consequences of having information at our fingertips. And there was a very sort of uncontroversial, I hope, claim made on the back of some experiments, basically that given the available technology, our organic brains tend to internally store not the information about a topic, but rather how to find that information using the technology. So there's some experiments which show this is always good to get the data, but the, the result is unsurprising. If you've got a group of people and they're given some pretty simple facts to learn, Right? And, uh, and you, just, you just tell one group of people that the facts will be available later on a piece of technology and tell them where they can find it, and you take another group of matched subjects and you don't tell them that, the, group of, the second group will remember the facts and the first group, using their organic brains, the second group will remember in their organic brains how to find that information using the available technology. But they offload the data storage or data recall uh, onto the technology. So nothing surprising about that. What was great was the way it was reported by The Guardian. After a perfectly accurate 
description of the experiments and the results, they had the heading, poor memory, blame Google. Right? Now you can see why someone would have that reaction. But notice what's going on here. The Guardian is thinking of memory as something that's to do with the brain, essentially. Right? That's something that happens in the brain. That's basically the background here. The, re the experimenters themselves had a rather more upbeat message. They said, uh, this is an adaptive use of memory in which the computer and online search engines should be counted as an external memory system that can be accessed at will. Now, this isn't quite specific enough to get to this idea of extended cognition, which we'll come to in a moment, but it's putting us on the right route. It's putting us on the route where we think about our engagement with technology, not as it were as making memory worse, but as changing the shape of it, changing the structure of it. But here's a question I want to ask today. And this is the question that's going to you know, drive this for the, 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 the rest of this talk. What do the people know here? The people who have uh, not stored the facts themselves in their brains, but have stored where to find the information using the available technology. What do they know? What's the answer to the epistemic question? Do they know the facts, or do they merely know how to find them? Right? Now, we know what's stored in their brain is how to find them, but what do they know? Okay? And I'm going to suggest, from one angle, there's a radical answer to this question. But to see it, we have to make a philosophical distinction between two of the E's that was mentioned earlier, the embedded and the extended view. So here's uh, the embedded view. The machinery of mind, the physical the parts of the physical world that realise or instantiate cognitive states and processes, on the embedded view, remain inside the individual, paradigmatically inside the brain. But of course, the performance of those cognitive processes can be scaffolded, perhaps sometimes in necessary ways, by the available technology. Right? So the, the cognition happens in the brain, but the results, the behaviour, the outcomes of the reasoning, or whatever it may be, that might essentially involve close couplings between the brain, the body, and the world. Simple examples, you know, uh, doing a mathematical sum by using pen and paper. Right? You might think that the cognition is still what's going on in the brain, that's where the thinking's happening, the real thinking, but of course you won't get the answer. Perhaps you couldn't get the answer unless you use the pen and paper. So that would be a case of embedded cognition. The extended cognition theorist, of which I count myself as one, wants to say something more radical. The extended cognition theorist wants to say that the machinery of mind, the parts of the physical world where thinking actually happens, if you like the parts of the world that psychology ought to study as its own domain, is constitutively distributed over brain, body and world. And that word constitutive is doing work there. Literally, the idea here is that ripping the technology away from you would be, for all intents and purposes, equivalent to ripping out some of your neurons. That's the kind of tagline, if you want to kind of, you know, press it in a sexy way. So the idea here is that we've got two views, one in which thinking remains internal, but of course we recognise the complexity and subtlety of our interaction with cognitive ecologies and the technology in those ecologies. And on the other view, we say, look, hang on, what we really ought to be saying is that thinking isn't just internal. Thinking itself is something that's constitutively distributed over brain, body, and world, and essentially over the available technology. So now we can ask the question about knowledge again. So in the cognitive sense of the term, is knowledge extended or merely embedded? Okay, that's the question we can ask. Now, there's a thought experiment in the extended mind literature that I detest for all kinds of reasons, but I'm going to use today because it's a nice way, actually, to get the, the main thought I want out in the open. Right, so the example goes like this. We imagine this character, Otto. This is the, the, due to Andy Clark and Dave Chalmers. We imagine this character, Otto. And Otto has this completely imaginary, mild form of Alzheimer's, or well, it might be serious form of Alzheimer's, but it's, it only affects a very particular part of Otto's cognitive performance. The idea is that Otto's brain can't store certain declarative facts, such as the address of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. That's the example Clark and Chalmers use. To, to deal with this, what Otto's learned to do over many years is to store relevant facts in a notebook that he carries around with himself all the time, and that given certain desires or certain questions, he'll pull out from his pocket and in a very automatic, uncritical way, without, as it were, questioning the provenance of the information, will just, we'll just guide his action or provide the answer to a question asked 
by looking in the book. So we have this uh, notebook. He, he forms the desire to go to the Museum of Modern Art. He quickly, automatically, fluidly, fluently, uncritically pulls out his notebook, looks up the address of the Museum of Modern Art and sets off for 53rd Street. Now, Clark and Chalmers claim in, in the Extended Mind paper, the original paper that started this, this business off, that we should think about Otto as having the dispositional belief that the Museum of Modern Art is on 53rd Street before he looks in his notebook. Okay? That's the key claim. It has to be before he looks in his notebook. After he looks in his notebook, the information could be transferred from the notebook into his brain, and of course we have a completely ordinary internal story about, about the belief that's guiding his behaviour. But Clark and Chalmers say, think about the dispositional belief. Now, we've all got dispositional beliefs, right? A uh, few moments ago, I, uh, I certainly believed that my daughter is 10 years old, but it wasn't part of my conscious experience. Now, of course, it is. And that's what philosophers call a dispositional belief, a belief that would come to your conscious experience if we ask you the right question or the right context occurs. And Clark and Chalmers argue that Otto, extended Otto, if you like, the Otto notebook system, has the dispositional belief that the Museum of Modern Art is on 53rd Street. So before he looks in his notebook, the extended Otto system has this belief. That's according to Clark and Chalmers. So that's the extended mind picture. Otto's dispositional belief is distributed physically, constitutively, into his notebook. Now, it seems that if that belief is true or justified, whatever, way, whatever you think the conditions are for a belief to become knowledge, that's a separate philosophical argument, goes back at least as far as Plato, nobody's settled that one yet, but whatever the conditions on knowledge are, all right, then it looks like Otto has extended knowledge. Right? If Otto has an extended dispositional belief, and it's true, and it's justified in the right kind of way, then you'd think that Otto has extended knowledge. So knowledge as a cognitive state is something, if this is true, that spreads out from Otto's brain into his notebook. And of course, this centrally involves his physical mechanisms of pulling the notebook out of his pocket, looking in it, and so on. So it involves embodied interactions with that notebook as well. Of course, the embedded cognition theorist is going to have none of this. right? The embedded cognition theorist will say that prior to looking in his notebook, Otto has no such dispositional belief, and so doesn't have knowledge. What Otto knows is how to find out the information right, by looking in his book. So we have this split in the literature, in the distributed cognition literature, between these two views. According to the embedded view, Otto doesn't know the facts, he knows how to find them out. According to the extended view, Otto knows the facts. Or extended Otto knows the facts. The Otto notebook system. All right, so that just gives you a sense of the split between two groups who are part of the broad distributed cognition and cognitive ecology literature, right, the embedded and the extended view. I, I go through that to make it very clear that the extended view says something different to the embedded view, right, so we can keep those views apart. Now I'm just going to take a very swift side journey to make a point about knowledge. This is a pure, a pure bit of philosophy, and then we'll come back to the technology case and try and say something interesting. Let me just check how I'm doing for time. Um, it should be fine, right. So there's this view of knowledge that's very, very plausible, I think, to a lot of people, called the credit view of knowledge, or the credit theory of knowledge, not really a theory. As a philosopher would put it, okay, this view is that knowing that P, some proposition, implies deserving epistemic credit for truly believing that P. Here's the intuitive gloss. Knowing is believing the truth because of the correct application of one's cognitive abilities. The idea here is that to know something, you have to have some kind of cognitive credit for the thing that you know. Now, this produces a plausible attribution of knowledge in a whole range of cases. Right? Now, here's my favourite. Um, I, I don't think this is apocryphal. It was told to me by someone from the W3C Consortium. And I think it's true. So, Chris Messina, of course, the, uh, the inventor of the hashtag on Twitter, okay, apparently one day went into, uh, into his uh, garage and uh, the mechanic came out and said, oh, yeah, your car's not working. You need one of these. Right? Chris... Messina, not believing mechanics at first sight, decided to check this in the way that he would, which is basically to go onto Twitter. Right? Now, if you're Chris Messina, you have an enormous number of Twitter followers. Right? And very quickly, he was able to crowdsource the information about whether he really needed this part and how much they cost and so on. Now, that's a, an interesting case of a cognitive ecology, of a, of a knowledge ecology, of an epistemic ecology. 
But there's nothing really sort of extended about this, right? So Chris Messina uses the technology, he gets the information that he needs, he believes it, it's knowledge, let's assume it's, it's true. It's kind of justified because he knows that he's got this vast amount of people online who statistically speaking will probably tell him the truth, right? So it's got a good justification story. But of course the information here, just as it were, comes from the social web into, into his brain. So this isn't really that, that kind of upsetting for the, for the traditional view. It's an embedded story. Now, interestingly, however, uh, there's been a, a movement within epistemology against this credit theory of knowledge, against this idea that knowing something requires that you get credit. You, have, you, you must have credit for knowing it. Right? Somehow you're to, this has to be down to the fact that you've used your cognitive abilities in the, in the right kind of way. And Jennifer Lackey has argued for the following situation. You turn up in a new town, all right, you don't know anything about this place. Say it's New York. Okay, you come out of Central Station and you walk up to someone and you say, where's the Museum of Modern Art? And as it happens, this person tells you exactly where it is and off you go. Now, Lackey's thought here is that you don't deserve credit for the information. Right? Let's just say that you just walked off the train, you picked the first person who didn't look drunk. Right? But it turned out to be true, information. Lackey's thought here is the following. You don't get the credit for the truth of this information, right? That person does. Yet you know where the Museum of Modern Art is. That's Lackey's point. Now, we can argue about this. Lots of philosophers do. But the idea is that if Lackey's right, okay, this shows that one can have knowledge without credit, without the correct application of one's cognitive abilities. The correct application of the cognitive abilities is due to the person you asked in the, in the, in the station. But here's... That raised this question of credit, right? And this is where I'm just going to go for the last few minutes to get this, get a sense of what we're the sort of things we need to look at here when we think about the technology-mediated cases. Here's a lovely example: it's unpublished work just just about to come out from Ken Izawa, one of the real critics of the extended cognition view. It's a lovely example. So, so this shows you where this idea of credit can get murky. So here's Ken's example. Otis, remember Otto, right? There's supposed to be a link there. Otis is a complete slacker student, right? Always cuts class, sleeps in, but he's got a strategy, right? He makes little note cards from the textbook and he smuggles them into exams. Let's say he does this for an exam and he gets a 92, right? Now his tutor challenges him. His tutor says, Otis, right? You've never been to class. You're a total slacker. How come you got 92? Otis tells him. The tutor calls him a cheat. But Otis has read Clark and Chalmers. <laughs> so Otis says, but hang on, right? I've integrated these note cards into my cognitive capacity. I don't question them, blah, blah, blah. Right? I deserve, just like Otto, I've got an extended, some extended knowledge here. I deserve the 92. The tutor says, yes, your overall performance using your notebook got an A, but your overall performance did not involve the cognitive capacities that were the subject of the test. That's why you fail. So Otis deserves some credit here, but somehow it's the wrong sort of credit for knowledge. But why precisely? Here's a case from Vason in the extended knowledge literature that raises this question of credit in the technological case and trying to get us close to this idea of what's needed. Here's a, an interesting fact. Airport baggage inspectors use x-ray scanners. They get bored. Right? And after 9-11, there was a lot of worry about this. So some scanners are now fitted with some false positive technology that keeps the baggage inspectors alert. Uh, as they're looking at the, the scans, there'll be a, uh, uh, they'll see something that's not supposed to be there, say a gun, and they click on the image to find out whether it's a false positive. It's a false positive, they just go on. But the idea is it keeps them alert. Now imagine this character, Sissy, who's an inspector whose career straddles both the old and the new part, sorts of scanner. That's important, but for reasons I won't go into uh, unless I get asked. Sissy inspects a bag containing a weapon. Thanks to the new device, her vigilance is high. Right? So the technology's done its job. So she forms a true belief regarding the contents of the suitcase. There's a gun in there. That's true. Now let's get back to this notion of credit. Vason argues that here we have a case of knowledge without credit. Sissy knows there's a gun in the bag, right? but she doesn't get the credit for it. Why not? Because it's the technology that explains why she spotted the gun. It's the technology that gets, as it were, the credit if there's any to be dished out. Or the designer of the scanner, if you like. You can play it more than one way. 
So Vason argues, it's just like Lackey's visitor case, right? Sissy deserves the, 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 the accreditation of knowledge, but it's the technology that, ex, that gets the credit. Right? So she's, she knows the, bat, the gun's there, but doesn't deserve the credit for it, because she does the correct application of cognitive capacities here has to be attributed to the scanner. Now, I just want to make a simple point, first of all, right? If we're really talking about extended cognition here, sissy gets the credit, right? Or extended sissy gets the credit, right? If the technology, like Otto's notebook, has been integrated into her ordinary everyday behaviour, right, in such a way that she uncritically you know, depends on that false positive technology to do its job, so it's been dynamically integrated in the kind of way that Otto's notebook was into her behaviour, so we can say the technology is really part of this extended cognitive system, then the false positive technology counts as part of extended sissy and it gets the credit. So extended sissy, sissy plus false positive technology, not only counts as knowing about the weapon, she does so on good credit theory grounds because the epistemic success is an achievement of an extended cognitive system that includes the relevant technology. And here's why this is interesting. It points us towards something that's sufficient for the right sort of credit having the right sort of credit. And it's something that our hero, coming to the end of things now, Calvisius Sabinus, almost got right. Here's a little interesting story. Uh, for the last few minutes, just going to tell this one. Hellenistic Greek mythographers describe characters that are called mnemones, rememberers. And they're often assigned to epic heroes to remind those heroes to perform or usually not to perform some action. So a nice example of this, uh, um, Protesilus uh, was forewarned by an oracle or something that he shouldn't be first off the boat at Troy, otherwise he'd be, he'd be killed. So he, employ he employed a rememberer to make sure that he remembered that. Of course, classic stuff, the rememberer gets distracted, doesn't tell Protesilus in time, he gets off the boat and the rest is history, right? That's classic stuff from these sort of Greek myths. Now recall Calvisius Sabinus, right? Calvisius Sabinus had an army of memory slaves, right, who committed to their organic memories poetry that they would recite on demand at dinner parties to make him look smart. But here's something I didn't tell you earlier. Calvisius Sabinus, it seems, from what we can tell, was committed to the following thought. If one of my slaves knows something, then I know it. Right? Why did he think that? Because he owns the slaves. Right? So Calvisius Sabinus knew that ownership of a cognitive process was sufficient for credit. Of course, his notion of ownership was screwed up, right? You know, just like it wouldn't be true that Sissy gets to own stuff by actually buying the technology, like the false positive technology. So we need a different notion of ownership. But the point is right. We need to think about when is it that technology becomes owned by the individual in the right kind of way. Now, I think there is a real issue here, an interesting issue, I think the way to solve it, I'm not going to go into details because I just want to say one very quick thing to finish. I think the way to solve this issue is, is to do what some philosophers of cognitive science call go subpersonal. Right? What that means is we need to go down to the level of the mechanisms concerned and think about the way they're integrated with each other in some kind of scientifically sort of respectful way. I haven't got time to go very far into that. But it's the idea here is that the notion of ownership we need is a functional integration notion. All that stuff to do with Otto uncritically trusting his notebook uh, and so on and so on, automatically pulling it out in the right way and not thinking about what he has to do, not questioning the information in. That's because that notebook has been functionally integrated into his behaviour at a very deep level. And that's what we need for ownership. And if we can get ownership, then it looks like we get credit, and if we get credit, we get knowledge. And so here's the last thing, last slide. I'm going to run through this very quickly. Why does credit matter for knowledge? I'm going to give you the next is where I'm going to say something sort of positive and practical, right? That comes out of the philosophy. Imagine a more technologically advanced OP, right? OP don't use note cards, right? OP's got a whole legion of smartphones and stuff, right? Where technology couples seamlessly and transparently with and is functionally integrated with the learner, like a teenager's personalised smartphone, that might be evidence of an extended mind, and thus I think of an extended knower. And that surely is something we want to teach and examine, right? An extended knower, an extended mind. 
Of course, you don't want to ignore the naked brain. I take many of Steve's points right. Of course, you don't want to ignore the naked brain. But we have to think about brains as deeply coupled with the technology around us. So I think, for instance, something about my teenage son. Anyone who's got children of the right age here will often have been irritated when they try and talk to them and they've got their music in one ear and they're playing their iPad and they've got one eye on, uh, on YouTube, probably watching one of the, the, the gamers we, one of the talks uh, in one of the sessions earlier was about. And, and the unnatural reactions of parents to say, this child is not concentrating, not paying attention. I just think we need to be training children to do that, right? To be multiple data handlers, right, in the modern world. That's what we need to be looking for. We need to start to educate the brain to be an effective part of a technological assemblage, of a cognitive ecology, of a knowledge ecology. So that's just one little message I think comes out of this literature. The contemporary knowledge ecology is increasingly wired, wireless, and technologically enhanced. And epistemology really needs to catch up. Thanks very much.